So it's been a while since I've done one of these, and ever since I did the last one, my list of free-to-play games I need to get through has gotten quite big. Expect a shorter wait for the next one. Maybe. Uh, you know what, I shouldn't actually say these things, I can never keep on top of the things I say. Nevertheless, here are six more games that I found using Steam's Discovery Queue feature. I'm still sticking to games on Steam since it is the platform that I use. I may branch out to places like itch.io in the future, but it'll take me a while to figure that place out, so for now it's just Steam. Got a colourful mix of titles for this episode, ranging from vibrant puzzle games, to space colony simulators, to bloody anxiety inducing experiences. Quite a wide range. As far as my upload schedule is concerned, it's been a bit all over the place lately, and I can't promise that will change. I have a few big videos in the works though, so hopefully the wait will be worth it. As always, if people have free-to-play games they'd like to see mentioned in these videos, then don't hesitate to comment them down below. Likewise, if you're a developer who wants to have a spotlight on their game, let me know and I'll feature it. Within reason though, don't give me porn games. Anyway, enough rambling, let's get to the video. Classified Stories Color Out of Space is a first-person horror-slash-puzzle game taking place inside a house overgrown with sinister vines. You play as Daniel, a resident of a nearby town who decides to investigate the house after being approached by a boy who claimed his father was acting strange and was dangerous to be around. Inspired by the Lovecraft novel The Color Out of Space, as inconspicuously pointed out in the game's title, this adaptation sees you uncovering a mystery. Nobody seems to be home when you get there, the main thing that stands out is the abundance of strange vines covering much of the home. I will admit, the game is quite unsettling. The atmosphere and lighting feel spooky, and the low volume ambience make any sudden appearances feel all the more shocking. It definitely keeps you on edge, and I'd say it's the best aspect of the experience overall. Likewise, there's been a noticeable effort put into the world building, with various letters scattered throughout the many rooms providing some insight into what actually happened here. I haven't read the story that this is inspired by, so I couldn't really tell you anything as far as similarities are concerned. You aren't given much in the way of objectives, it's very much a case of you figuring things out on your own, which I liked. There's hardly any hand-holding at all, which makes it all feel like you're actually conducting your own investigation. Unfortunately, when combat gets introduced, it starts to lose its charm a bit. Melee attacks feel very unimpactful and tedious, which is further exacerbated by the AI that can trap you rather easily. The animations leave quite a bit to be desired as well. On top of that, the game doesn't save your progress, so if you die, you have to redo the whole thing. I ended up dying. I didn't want to do the whole thing again, so I left it there. Overall, it's decent, I just think the combat needs touching up a bit. Aztlan Uncovered, I've probably butchered that name, I'm sorry, is a short third-person puzzle game where you play as, I assume, some kind of archaeologist. She's probably not an archaeologist, but the game doesn't tell you what she is, so I'm going with that. Taking place in a newly discovered tropical zone located in the middle of a frozen wasteland, you must uncover the secrets of a mysterious temple placed in the centre of the region. From the looks of things, it hasn't been inhabited for a while, with its remains being overgrown and lost to time. Speaking of time, you are equipped with a device that allows you to control it. Well, sort of. You have a tool on your wrist that allows you to shoot time bubbles. Anything caught in these bubbles has its state reverted, so if you aim it at a broken bridge, for example, chances are it'll be brought back to a fixed state. Despite being a standout feature, the core of the gameplay doesn't completely revolve around this. Like I said before, the game contains puzzles, but these are pretty traditional challenges that involve guiding a beam of light to a specific target, using mirrors to reflect it to its required destination. There's a small handful of these, and they aren't overly difficult in all honesty. Some require the use of the time bubble device, yes I'm calling it that, usually to get something out of the way or to repair a mirror, but that's as far as it goes. They're still fun though, even if they are on the simple side of things. Aside from the character model sticking out a bit, the visuals are nice to look at, and the design of the temple and its surroundings is very well executed. The forest is lush and detailed, and the soundtrack is relaxing as well. So overall, it's a cool concept with some moderately engaging puzzles that'll keep you engaged for about 10-15 to 15 minutes. 
I do wish there was a bit more, but regardless, I enjoyed what was there. Okay, so this one deserves a video of its own, and I will be working on that soon because it's in a whole different league. The complex found footage is a first person horror game taking place in the infamous back rooms. I'm not going to go into detail on what the back rooms are, but they are essentially what you're seeing right now. Giant empty spaces filled with corridors and dim lighting. Though similar to other titles taking place in this location, there are other levels to explore through as well. It begins with you waking up in the back rooms, and the first thought that popped into my head when seeing the game for the first time was just how authentic it all looked. I will state that my insight into the back rooms lore is limited. I basically only have Kane Pixel series to go off from, but if we're going from that, then it completely nails the aesthetic. Your objective is. well, you don't have an objective. You've woken up in a place you don't recognise with no obvious way out, and are completely lost from the beginning. The best you can do is walk around. That's very much what this game is, a walking simulator in its purest form. And yet, it's bloody amazing. And terrifying. I'm not entirely sure what makes it stand out the most, to be honest. The slow realistic movements, the retro visual filters, the impeccable lighting, the incredibly eerie atmosphere that always makes you feel like you're being followed, all the surreal level design that manages to mess with your head. I guess it's all of the above. Everything about the game's design and execution is done with one thing in mind, making you feel uncomfortable. And it doesn't do that through the traditional mechanisms used in horror. It's done by slowing everything down, giving you no guidance whatsoever, and making you feel isolated and alone. It's anxiety inducing, and I'm not exaggerating that in the slightest. The game was made using Unreal Engine 5, and that's something that's easy to spot. Visually, it's outstanding to look at. For those who have seen videos from Kane Pixels, it looks like something straight out of one of those. Like I said before, I am going to talk about this game more in a different video, so stay tuned for that. In the meantime, play it. It's nothing short of a work of art. Planet S is a sci-fi strategy game that has you establish, maintain, and grow a colony on an alien planet of your choosing. You'll start off on one planet, but as your settlement grows and the demand for new resources increases, you'll end up expanding to other planets as well. Taking place in a remarkably busy solar system, I mean seriously, look how many planets there are, you have three types of biomes to choose from. Once you've picked one, you move your colony ship into orbit and set up a base on the surface. It's worth noting that the map is procedurally generated, so the planets will look different on each playthrough. Once you're settled, your next tasks consist of setting up mining operations, utilising the local resources, and building housing sectors for your population. It's pretty typical stuff if you've played these kinds of games before. That's not to say it isn't challenging though. In all honesty, I never really got the hang of it during my time playing. It can be quite difficult keeping track of the upkeep each building has, and as you begin to upgrade your buildings, the need for different resources increases, meaning you have to constantly expand if you want to stay afloat. There is a tutorial, and it's definitely a useful one, but after that's done, it felt like I was trying to push a boulder up a hill. In terms of visuals, it's nothing special, but it's still nice to look at. The art style is charming, and there isn't anything that sticks out like a sore thumb. When I played, all of the trees were wearing Christmas hats, which I thought was pretty funny. As a concept, Planet S is really promising, and what's been done so far is certainly a good start. The game's currently in early access, with updates still being released. There's also a multiplayer mode which I haven't tried, but looks fun. I can see myself going back to this one. Well worth a try. Cloud Climate is a first-person walking simulator taking place in a post-apocalyptic world that has seen humanity build to reach the clouds in a desperate attempt to retrieve water as the population declines. So quite a happy game then. You play as a lone builder, one of the last surviving humans who still intent on building one of the unfinished towers despite the hopeless circumstances. Your goal is to reach this unfinished tower and climb to the top of it. On the way, you are met with a couple of challenges, but the overall gist of the game is to take in the views and invest time into its world building. Various notes and letters can be found scattered throughout each building you go to, which paints a vivid picture of the events leading up to the present day. Pretty much everything about this short experience is bleak. 
There's no music whatsoever, and there isn't much sound in general, save for the main character's voice, and even that is sombre. This isn't a case of finding the light at the end of the tunnel. It doesn't matter how high you build, it's already over before you get to the final tower. Needless to say, it's quite a captivating story, even if it is depressing. My favourite aspect of the game, however, was the visuals. They honestly remind me of Borderlands, particularly the first game. Cell shaded art styles are usually attributed to cheerful titles, but the contrast works really well here. You don't need to be told that this is a post-apocalyptic world because it's pretty evident straight away. Outside of voiceovers, the main sound you'll hear is wind. Aside from that, the silence is deafening, which makes the atmosphere excellent. Everything looks and feels dead, and it's weird to say that in a positive context. Out of all the games in this video, this one definitely has the best story, so if you're looking for a short, interesting post-apocalyptic experience, this one is worth a go. As a fun fact, it's made by the same guy that made Choo Choo Charles. That's quite the change of direction. Resonance of the Ocean is a top-down puzzle game taking place on a tiny remote island. You play as its only inhabitant when you hear a strange sound coming from a nearby island. It's musical in nature, and you are tasked with repeating the sound in an attempt to communicate with whoever is producing it. This is achieved by picking up various items littered around, playing and amplifying them with a speaker. If the sound is recreated correctly, you move on to the next sound. The difficulty increases as you progress, with the sounds becoming harder to reproduce. Altogether, there are four levels, and each one introduces new items. Some can be used as instruments, whereas others can be mixed together to create different types of sounds. That's about as complex as the game gets, but the last two levels can be surprisingly challenging. Where the game truly excels at is in its art and sound departments. The beautiful hand-drawn art style is stunning to look at, especially when it comes to the wind and the ocean waves. Likewise, the sounds you make are quite unique, and the way it echoes across the islands is highly effective. It's also ever so slightly creepy, which I know wasn't the intent, but still. There isn't much of a story, but there is a bit of world building. You get a brief insight into the desolated state of the island and how it came to be, but you don't know anything about the main character, or what's really producing those sounds. In all honesty though, I like that. The fact that it's all a mystery adds to the charm. It's a surprisingly cosy game despite the circumstances, which is likely helped by the vibrant and colourful visuals. Overall, it's a cute game that'll keep you busy for about 20 minutes or so. There's no save function, so be prepared to go through it in one sitting. I mean, it's 20 minutes, so that should be easy. I recommend it. So that was episode 3. I usually make a tirade at the end of these on how games development is hard, and you should try out these free-to-play experiences because some of them are better than big games released today, but there's only so many ways I can word that speech. All I can say now then is that you should play them. Broaden your horizons a bit. Anyway, enough of that. I hope there was at least one game on that list that stood out to you. Let me know if any of them captured your interest, and I'd love to hear your opinions on them as well. If you enjoyed the video, then be sure to give it a like, and if you would like to see more videos like this one, as well as reviews for indie games and the occasional off-topic video, then be sure to subscribe. Until the next one, I'll see you next time. Bye.